Friends, go ahead and stand and let's worship together. It wasn't for nothing but you shed your blood. So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone. I won't be shackled to the way I was. I'm gonna live like my chains are gone. Gonna shout like the battles Fall back devil cause your time is up I'm gonna live like the stone is gone Gone Now my sin is dead and gone And I see hallelujah Done, done He is risen, it is done I sing hallelujah How great the power of the blood Oh In Christ I'm the righteousness of God
Before my 
Let's pray together. God, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Who do we have in heaven beside you and on earth? There is nothing that satisfies the deepest desires of our hearts beside you. So I pray that you would open our eyes to the truth of those words. That we would see just how empty the things of this world are apart from you. And how we have no true good apart from you. May we find that rest. May our eyes be open to see things as you see them. And we trust and believe that you will do this for us so that we can come running back to you over and over again, knowing that your mercy does pull us in as we are, but does not leave us the same. We know this because we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Horizons Church. Will you say hello to your neighbor before you find your seat? Alrighty. Well, good morning, folks. Howdy, 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 howdy. Thanks for coming out, worshiping with us. Uh, for all of you who are wondering, I did survive the uh, what I thought was extinct flu last weekend. I, uh, you know, I was supposed to preach, and Friday I was like, man, I don't, I don't feel very good. I better go make sure I'm okay. And they're like, we're going to test you for COVID and the flu. I was like, well, that's fine. I don't care. And so she tests me, and she comes back. She's like, you don't have COVID. And I was, I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm just regular sick. And she's like, no, you got the flu. I was like, the flu? Who in the world gets the flu anymore? Who in the, you yeah, haven't had a flu in like two years. What in the world is the flu? But anyway, I, I managed to resurrect that extinct disease uh, last weekend. But I lived. It's fine. You know, it's all good. Better in a couple days. So uh, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us. Uh, my name's Lucas. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, if you are new or recent, maybe this is your first time or we just haven't had a chance to say hi and meet you yet. Right over here, there's a welcome room where that sign just lit up. Pastor Josiah will be over there after the uh, message, and he would love to say hey, shake your hand, and uh, give you a little info about the church and a free gift just for swinging by and saying hi. So new or recent, head right over there, and we'd, uh, we'd love to meet you, all right? Other things are the app. We continue to encourage you guys to utilize that. Everything you could want or need in service, you've got connection cards, sermon notes, um, you got live stream, which if you're here, I don't know why you would also be wanting to watch the live stream. But, you know, if you want to, double dip, by all means, you can do it through the app. You can also access Sermon Catalog and giving through the app. So that's one of several different ways you can give here. Uh, we just came off of our Christmas offering where you guys really went above and beyond. Uh, you know, for the last two months or so, we've been really focusing on that and trying to... Uh, get the funds raised that uh, allows us to do what we do in Cambodia with the church orphan home. So thank you guys for that. Uh, if you want to continue giving or start giving, you can use any of the four ways on the screen, which I suppose the app makes five, but we're going to say four anyway, all right? So disregard that. It's four ways to give. Uh, four ways to give. Any of those will get her done, all right? Only other thing for me is the prayer room right over here to my left and your right. I'm not sure who's in there this service. Deanne's in there this service. Thank you, Josiah. Deanne's in there. Uh, so if any point in time uh, you'd like somebody to pray with you, she'd be more than happy to do that. Head right over there to the prayer room uh, and see Deanne. All right. I think that's it for me. There's a quick video announcement, and then Pastor Josiah will be up to deliver the message. Hi, moms and dads. If your little one finds it difficult to remain quiet in today's worship service, please be courteous to those around you and take advantage of our cry rooms located in the back of the sanctuary. If the cry rooms are occupied, we have tables and sofas for family viewing in our cafe. Either way, you'll be able to see and hear everything, and your child will enjoy the extra freedom. And now, here's your assistant campus pastor, Josiah Pitts. David Pallison was looking out the open window in his living room when he noticed a rather startling sight. A strange, disheveled man whom he didn't recognize was wandering up and down the street in front of his house, 
going through cigarettes like they were Tic Tacs, jerking his head to the side repeatedly, and shouting incessantly, okay, 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 into the air. Now, David was a biblical counselor, but it didn't take a certified counseling license to recognize that this guy was slightly off his rocker. But David wasn't too terribly concerned about it because he figured this guy would just keep shouting, walking, and eventually make his way out of the neighborhood. But one minute of erratic pacing and shouting turned into five minutes, turned into 10 minutes, turned into 15 minutes with no sign that this guy was going anywhere. And finally, by the 15-minute mark, this strange, disheveled man was actually trespassing through people's backyards, leaving cigarette butts in his wake, still jerking his head and still shouting, okay, okay. But at this point, David was becoming concerned that this guy might actually pose a legitimate danger to him and to his neighbors. So he did what any responsible citizen would do in that kind of a situation. He rang up 911 and told them that some erratic lunatic was wandering through people's backyards and they needed to come deal with him. So sure enough, just a few minutes later, a squad car rolled up in front of David's house where the disheveled man was now standing, still jerking his head to the side, still chain smoking, and still shouting okay into the air. So David watched through the open window in his living room as the policeman rolled down his window, leaned his head out, and said, Can I help you, buddy? At which point, this lunatic leapt over to the police car, and David thought for sure, all oh, this guy's going to attack. He's going to lash out. He's going to do something awful to this poor police officer. But David was in for quite a surprise because when the strange man got over to the police officer, he didn't lash out. He didn't clench his fist for a strike. Instead, he began effusing. He said, oh, officer, I'm so glad you're here. I'm new to the neighborhood, and I was walking my little brown dog, and he's lost. His name's Jose, and I've been so nervous looking for him, and I just, I can't find him anywhere, and he doesn't know his way back home, and could you please keep an eye out for my little dog? And the police officer nodded and said, sure thing, buddy, I'll keep an eye out, and rolled up his window and drove away. So David had entirely misperceived and misunderstood this whole situation. As he put it in his own words, I had important facts that concerned me. A strange, disheveled man, agitated, chain-smoking, repeatedly shouting a word that rhymed with or sounded like okay into the air, and trespassing. But once I saw in a different light, everything changed. Should I have felt threatened, or should I have felt compassion? Should I have called 911, or should I have gone looking for a lost puppy? Because when you see differently, you interpret differently, and then you act differently. In other words, you could say you, when you see truly, you can live and respond duly in light of the facts. See, David thought he had was a rather straightforward situation. You know, strange man wandering around the neighborhood, shouting incessantly, which led him to believe that he and his neighbors might be in danger. But rather than asking himself whether he was actually seeing all there was to see, whether or not he actually had all the facts, he instead simply assumed that he was seeing all there was to see. And then he filled in the gaps with a story of his own making, a story that, as it turned out, was completely and utterly wrong and led him to approach the situation wrongly. Rather than offering to help a distressed dog owner find his lost puppy, he called 911 on a man that he was convinced was a veritable lunatic who had escaped out of the local asylum. But if he had seen truly, he could have acted duly. In other words, if he had seen the situation for what it actually was, a poor man who'd lost his dog rather than a lunatic who's lost his mind, his actions could have properly fit reality. He had gone looking for a lost dog instead of calling 911. Now, thankfully, it was all said and done. David's foible was a rather innocent mistake. But his foible isn't limited to him. Because we misunderstand and misperceive things all the time, too. Now, you, you just take perhaps some common examples. Let's suppose it's your birthday and you're really excited to spend the day with your spouse. Maybe you're thinking they'll take you to your favorite restaurant. But then all day long, they seem so strangely aloof. 
Like they don't want to talk to you. They seem unconcerned about your birthday. And you start looking at that sense data, all those facts that concern you. And you start thinking, they must have forgotten my birthday. How dare they? And you start getting angry and frustrated with them. And you fume about it all day long until you come home after work at night flip on the lights in your living room, and surprise, all your family and friends are there for a surprise party that your spouse was organizing and couldn't let you in on. Now, now that you've seen things differently, don't you think it was better to have responded differently? Should you have felt angry and hurt, or should you have been asking, maybe I'm not seeing all there is to see here. Maybe they're working on something they can't let me in on. Who knows? But we also do it in more serious situations. And perhaps you've got a good friend you love, you haven't seen in a while, and you both have an opening in your calendars. So you set up lunch at a restaurant. You get there, get a booth, and one minute of waiting turns into five, turns into 10, turns into 15. And by the 30-minute mark, the waitress comes around and says, you got stood up, didn't you? And you start thinking, yeah, you know what? Maybe I'm not as important to my friend as I thought I was, and maybe they aren't really all that I thought they were, and maybe they don't care, and you go back and start fuming about them to your coworkers, only to discover the next day the reason they didn't show up is because their mom was having a heart attack, and they had to race to the hospital, and they were out of self-service, and they couldn't get a hold of you. And maybe you should have responded differently. Maybe that you see things in a truer light, you can ask yourself, should I have been angry and fuming about them, or should I have asked myself if something had happened to them Should I have lifted them up in prayer? Should I have responded differently? Because when you see things truly, you can live and respond duly. The real problem, though, is not that we just misunderstand and misperceive things in our relationships with one another, with our family, friends, co-workers. Because we also do this in our relationship with God. We just misunderstand what's happening in our lives with Him. And it might be that our family is surrounded by hardships and the money in the savings account is dwindling down lower and lower and the work isn't picking up to refill it and replenish it. And we begin to worry about how we're going to feed our kids and we look at our lives and based on the sense data, based on those sheer important facts we can perceive with our naked eye, we simply begin to assume that we're seeing all there is and that God has forgotten us. He's abandoned us. And maybe he doesn't actually care as much as we thought he did. And then we begin to live our lives based on that interpretation of the facts. And we begin to turn our back on God and begin to experience the fallout that results from that. We begin feeling insecure, unsafe, abandoned. But what if we're not actually seeing all there is to see? What if there is more happening around us than initially meets the eye? Should we just assume when life gets hard that we're seeing all there is to see and then interpret life in light of those facts and live appropriately? Or should we stop and ask ourselves if there's something we're missing and then go to God and ask, am I not seeing everything clearly? Because God is often just waiting, just waiting to shed new light on our lives and what's happening around us so that we can see things anew and so that we come to understand that we're completely safe in his arms, that we're loved more deeply than we can ask or imagine, and thus interpret differently and thus act differently. In other words, God wants us to see truly so that we can live duly. And I'm sure that everyone sitting in this room, that sounds like an awesome prospect, doesn't it? I think we all want to see things as they are. We want our eyes open to the truth. We want to live our lives in actual accordance with the facts. The question for us is, how does that actually happen? Well, the prophet Elisha shows us at least one way that this happens and in rather spectacular fashion. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, in 2 Kings 6, Elisha and his servant were staring down a situation that would have made anyone of the most stalwart courage probably feel hopeless and despondent. In fact, that's exactly how Elisha's servant felt when he did look at the situation. But his master, Elisha, did not share 
his same fears, doubts, and despairs. Why? Because he saw things in a different light. He saw truly and was able to live and respond duly. And that leads us to this first truth. I can be set free from misunderstanding and fear by asking God to help me see truly through the eyes of faith. Now, you see, after General Naaman of the Syrian army was healed, through the word and the help of Israel's prophet Elisha, the king of Syria repaid the Israelites very nicely for their hospitality. He did so by sending his army into Israel to wage war. Really nice response for, you healed my general, so I'm going to send him to fight against you now. But there was one very big problem for Syria's king. That was, he would, he would gather his servants together in council and say, all right, I'm going to set up my camp in such and such a place so that I can sneak up on Joram. He won't know that I'm here, and he'll come right to me, spring this trap, and I'll take him out. Servants say, very good. Small problem, though. He would set up his camp, and then Joram, king of Israel, would somehow completely avoid him. Like, he would know, oh, Joram's going to come down this way, except Joram never did. It was like he always found out where Syria was encamped, and he would make an intentional effort to go around them. And it would be one thing if it happened one time, you know, like, ah, oh, this is a fluke. He just happened to change his route, or maybe he just caught wind that we were here, and he took another direction. But this didn't happen just once. It happened time and time and time again. I mean, as surely as day followed night, Joram would not go where Syria had encamped. And it finally got so bad that the king of Syria called all his servants together and said, which one of you rotten scumbags is betraying me to the king of Israel? I'm sure all the servants looked around at one another nervously and said, calm down, no one's betraying you. There is a prophet in Israel, perhaps you remember him, named Elisha. He knows what you whisper on your pillow at night. That's a big problem if you're trying to conduct a military campaign secretively. And so Sirius King hatches this brilliant, simple plot to take care of this issue. He decides to send his army, probably tens of thousands of soldiers, to the city of Dothan, where Elisha was staying, by night, in order to sneak up on him and catch him. Now, stop for a minute and think about that. This is a prophet who knows every place you set up camp. He knows the words you whisper on your pillow at night. And you think you're going to sneak up on him with your army because you sent them at night? Oh, well, he doesn't have prophetic powers in the dark, probably. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And yet he does it. He sends his whole army to capture this one stinking old prophet. Now that morning... After the army had encamped around Dothan, Elisha's servant woke up as the sun rose, rolled out of his bed, took a little stroll through the city. And when he looked beyond the walls, he looked and saw, and there was something glimmering, reflecting the sunlight. And he looked a little closer and realized the sun was reflecting off the armor of those Syrian soldiers and chariots. So he responded appropriately. He turned tail, ran to his master Elisha in a total panic and said, alas, my master, we're doomed. We're going to perish. What shall we do? But Elisha had no such fear, no such concern, no such despair. Because Elisha's servant wasn't actually seeing things as they really were. Elisha, on the other hand, he knew what was real. He saw truly, and he was able to respond duly. In fact, here's what we read in verse 16 of 2 Kings 6. He has the audacity to say this to his servant. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Well, yeah, Elisha, fat lot of good that's going to do when you're surrounded by a whole foreign army. Don't be afraid. Like If all it took to not feel fear was for us to say that to each other, we'd never be scared of anything. And the situation would be like a guy up in a tree watching his friend down below get charged at by a grizzly bear and say, don't be afraid. How does that help? It doesn't. <laughs> Unless you're not seeing everything. 
Because it doesn't work just to tell people, don't be afraid. You have to have good, solid, trustworthy reasons to not be afraid. And that's exactly what Elisha provides for his servant. And here's what he goes on to say. He gives a servant a reason not to fear. He says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, I'm sure at that moment that Elisha's servant looked at the hills, looked at Elisha, looked at the hills, looked at Elisha and said, are you nuts, old man? Like, we're in a little village. There are two of us and like 50,000 of them. Like, have you lost your mind? But that was because he wasn't seeing all there was to see. And he had important facts that concerned him. He saw Syrian soldiers, chariots, all these men armed to the teeth just to come capture him and his master. But he wasn't seeing truly. There was more going on there than met the eye. And so, Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full, not just of Syrian horses and chariots, but full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. In other words, the servant was afraid because as far as he could tell, all he could see was that they were surrounded by the chariots of Syria. I have no doubt that he was utterly astounded when he realized they were protected by the chariots of God. Because now he's seeing things as they really are. The same spiritual forces that kept Elijah from experiencing death when he was carried up in a whirlwind are the same exact forces that are protecting Elisha from death now. So who was responding appropriately in light of the facts? The freaked out servant or the calm, bold, and fearless Elisha? I think we all know who it was. That's not just an experience for Elisha's servant because God wants to open our eyes in much the same way. He wants us to be able to look beyond what we can perceive with our physical senses to see what's real beyond that. He wants to open the eyes of our heart, as the Apostle Paul might say it, so that we can see clearly through the eyes of faith. He wants us to see the world differently and thus interpret things differently so that we can act differently. He wants us to see truly so that we can live duly. But before we can talk about how that even happens in our midst, we really need to remember a very important fact. This gift of spiritual sight the likes of which Elisha's servant experienced, that is a gift that is completely God's to give out of his own sheer grace. You and I can't do anything to deserve that or to merit it or earn it. And that's even reflected in the way Elisha prays. In fact, the NIV doesn't pick this up. I don't know why, because every basic other major translation does. That when Elisha prays, what he actually prayed was, Oh, Lord, please... Open his eyes. Because Elisha knows that that kind of a gift is completely at God's prerogative to give. That's why he asks for it. And it's often not until we're in a situation that looks as desperate and hopeless as that one did that we even think to ask for this in the first place. Like if we see things and we think we're seeing all there is to see and we're good, we can handle it. We won't think to ask God for this kind of gift because we'll think we've got it all under control. But when we're in a, a plight that seems hopeless, that's precisely when we are most prone and need to go to God and ask, Oh Lord, open my eyes, please, so that I can see what's really happening here. Because God does love to grant that kind of prayer. Now the question is, how does he do it? <laughs> How does, if, if, if we take it that Elisha was also praying this for us in a sense, because all that was written in Scripture is for us too, how does that prayer get answered for us? I mean, if we're not going to see hosts of fiery chariots and angels encamped all around us, because that wasn't a common sight. There weren't very many people at all in Scripture who had their eyes open to see that. And the question is, is how we, do we have our spiritual eyes opened in such a way 
that we're set free from fear by seeing reality as God sees it. How do you learn to see that even though your eyes can't perceive it, the morning air really is all awash with angels? Well, according to the Word of God, the primary way this happens is through the prayerful, faithful reading of the Word of God. <laughs> I mean, you, you think about it. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 3, When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Or you learn to see truly through the Word of God. This isn't just about hearing, it's about seeing. Because this is the book where we hear and learn to see that in spite of appearances, God sends his angels as ministers of fire, not just to help people like Elijah, but to serve all of us. That's what Hebrews 1.4 says. 1.14, are not all God's angels ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? There are angels and armies of them at our service just as much as they were Elisha. Even though we can't see it. And quite honestly, it's probably merciful we can't because we'd probably want to fall down and die if we saw all those angels. But they're there. That's what God says. Or like when we gather together here at a church. Hebrews 12 says that when we come here, we're not just sitting in seats. We're not just singing songs and just hearing some guy open a book and preach. You know what the author of Hebrews says is actually really happening right now? We have come to the heavenly Mount Zion, to the festal gathering of innumerable angels. Right now, we are joining with the angels in their worship of God, and we are late to their worship service. They are like looking at their watches saying, so glad you could join us at 1110 on a Sunday morning. We've been doing this forever. We've been doing this since we were created. We have been crying out day and night for as long as we've been around. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So thank you for joining us. That's really happening right now. And this book is where we learn to see that the commander of these armies, the Lord God Almighty of hosts, the captain of angels, is himself for us and with us. Not just his angels. This is where we learn to see, like in the words of Isaiah 41.10, fear not. Don't fear anything. Why? Fear not, because I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will be with you. I will uphold you with my mighty right hand. That's what's real. And if you see that truly through the eyes of faith, doesn't that change everything? Doesn't that set you free from fear? It's through God's word that we learn to see these things in a new light. Thus we learn to interpret life differently and act differently. We can see truly here and live duly. I mean, the 24-hour news media mob is looking at all the same sense data that we're looking at. They see all the numbers about COVID and the new variants. They see Russia's troops mounting on the border of the Ukraine. They see all the craziness and chaos and evil happening in the world. And they've come to one conclusion looking at that data. Fear and doom. They're just like Elisha's servant saying, Alas, what are we going to do? We're going to perish. It's all doom and despair. And people eat that up and say, Yes, you're right. We got to watch out for ourselves. No one cares. No one is looking out for us. But we, as the church, as God's chosen and faithful people, we look at all that same sense data. We don't close our eyes to it. We see everything they're seeing. And we say what Elisha said. We say, don't be afraid. Because if you belong to God, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. We do what the psalmist did in Psalm 56, 3. Where he said, when I am afraid, because who among us hasn't looked around at the world and not felt fear from time to time? When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, 
whose word I praise, I trust in God, I shall not be afraid. For what can man do to me? The correct answer to that question is nothing. Can't do anything to you. Actually, in the words of Jesus, the worst they can do to you is kill you. That's good news. Believe it or not. Because what that means is they cannot destroy your soul. They cannot take away your hope. And they cannot separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So you don't have anything to be afraid of. And when you see that, it changes everything. Just like the psalmist. You go from saying, when I am afraid, to saying, I trust in God, I won't be afraid. Because you know that in spite of all appearances of the contrary, the God of angel armies himself is on your side, and he is always with you. He helps you to see truly so that you can live duly. Seeing reality in a new light doesn't just change how we interpret life and how we respond to hardships emotionally or spiritually. It also ought to change how we treat one another. I'll go even one step further, like Jesus did, and say that also ought to change how we treat even our enemies. Because, you know, it's all well and good when we come to God and he says things like, I'm going to be your fortress. I'll be your stronghold. I will love you with an everlasting love. And we're like, yes, Lord, we receive that in the midst of all this insanity and chaos. That is such a good, comforting word. Then he says, by the way, if you love me for what I've done for you, You'll keep my commands. And we go, okay, it's great. But then Jesus says things like, bless those who curse you. Uh, what? Pray for those who persecute you. What? Do good to those who hate you. Jesus, why? Why? I don't want to do that. To which God says, oh, so you must still be seeing the world through old eyes because the kind of people who don't want to do that when I've commanded it to them are the kind of people who think that actually, yeah, we see the world and it actually is a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there and we do have to watch out just for ourselves because there isn't any God in heaven who's actually taking care of us and there is no judge in heaven who will actually judge justly at the end of the world and therefore I have to take care of me and mine, which means I definitely don't do good to those who hate me. So you're still seeing the world through old eyes, right? Well, when you put it like that, because those who like Elisha and his servants see clearly through the eyes of faith that God really is provident. He really is gracious. He really is merciful. And who understand that we're actually bulletproof until our work for him is done. Those kinds of people are really freed. You hear me? Freed. To obey even these commands of God. And to experience the unique rewards that come with that kind of obedience. And that leads us to this next truth. When I see truly through the eyes of faith, I am freed to duly treat my enemies with gentle strength. So, Elisha's servant sees the angel armies that camped all around them, but guess what? Syrian army is still lurking and ready to come rushing into town. Because God's protective power does not automatically wipe away the enemy's presence. But it does mean that Elisha is just as safe in the face of an advancing army as he is asleep in his own bed. And here's what we go on to read next in the following verses, 18 to 23. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road, this is not the city. Follow me, and I will lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria, the capital city of Israel, their enemy. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. 
Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. Now they're the outnumbered ones, primed for slaughter. And when the king of Israel, Joram, saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you've captured with your own sword or bow? Would you mistreat prisoners of war that you took? And that didn't happen here. So set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Syria stopped raiding Israel's territory. Now you work through that little account and Elisha just like he'd asked God to open his servant's eyes, he asks God to blind the Syrian's eyes. The same word for blindness here is used in Genesis 19, when the angels strike blind the men outside of Lot's house. So this must have been some sort of day's day blindness, because Dothan was 12 miles away from Samaria. They'd walk 12 miles, this whole army. So they're following Elisha. They must somehow be kept from seeing and understanding who he is. And then he leads them right into the walled city of the enemy's capital. Worst nightmare. And it's only there that he then prays, okay, Lord, now open their eyes so they can see what a hopeless situation they're in. And they're thinking, wow, this guy just led us to Joram so we can be slaughtered. I mean, we might as well have just collectively walked off a cliff and saved ourselves the trouble. But before Joram orders his soldiers to strike, he defers to Elisha, this prophet who is known for his gentle strength. And so, rather than slaughtering these enemies, Elisha tells the king, set food before them. Rather than spilling their blood, fill their cups with water. In other words, Elisha was fulfilling the commands of passages like Exodus 23.4 and Proverbs 25.1. Treat your enemies well. When your enemy is hungry, feed him. When he is thirsty, give him cold water to drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. In other words, one of the best ways to rid yourself of an enemy, to turn him into a friend by acting in a friendly manner toward him. And our current culture has no concept for that (laughs) because they have no God of grace who can work that kind of transformation. So like if you want your enemies at your mercy, you annihilate them. But not so the people of God. We keep our eyes open for opportunities to turn our enemies into our friends because after all, isn't that what God did with us? While we were his enemies, Christ died for us. Not after we turned the corner and acted friendly toward him and when we hated him, when we spit on him, when we pulled out his beard, when we beat him and mocked him and reviled him. That was when he died for us. So if God did that for us, couldn't it just be that the same might happen with our enemies? And that's what happens here. They keep these strange, difficult commands, and guess what? The Syrians' eyes are opened, and they realize, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't go trespassing to Israel anymore, their God and their prophet, and peace is brought to the land. The Syrians didn't repent forever, but it did humble them enough to bring peace to their land. Now, thankfully, last I checked, you and I are not prone to dealing with invading armies. I have not yet found an army encamped around my house waiting to arrest me for preaching the gospel. Thank God. But where might seeing the world in a new light, seeing things as Elisha did, who knew that God is watching over us so we can be kind to our enemies, where might seeing the world in the new light free us to do the same kind of thing? rather than just treating our enemies hatefully in return and doing what we can to destroy them. Well, it might look something like this, as an example. I was talking this past week to a friend of mine. We'll call him Andy. I've changed some details of his story to protect the innocent. Andy, for a long time now, has been dealing with a very, shall we put it mildly, troublesome cousin. A man who acts very hatefully toward him. He He has threatened his life bodily. He has not been kind to him. He has been very wicked to his family. Now, based on just the stories I've heard from Andy, I'd say, listen, buddy, boundaries. You heard of them? 
don't ever talk to that guy again. Like, you just need to steer clear of him. And there may be a, there's a place and a time for that, to be sure. But this past week, <laughs> Andy's cousin had some electrical issues in the house, major electrical issues, like the kind that you don't want to be dealing with in the dead of winter. He was in a pretty helpless spot. And so he reached out to Andy, who has skills in electrical repair, the kind that he would need, and in a moment of humility said, hey, I, I kind of need some help. Now, if my friend Andy saw things in the world's light, he'd say, you know what, this is my opportunity to teach this, this little clown a lesson. i uh, teach him, you know what, you've been hateful and spiteful to me for years. No, I'm not going to help you. You need to figure things out. You've got to stop acting like such a jerk. But Andy sees truly. And so when he got that message, he saw an opportunity to respond in kindness and grace and say, you know what, maybe God could do something here. So he went over, fixed the issue, and guess what? He didn't just fix an electrical issue. And God began working in that moment to fix something going on in that guy's heart. And he's turned a corner. And he was just telling me this week that he's actually come around and is actually offering to help Andy in certain situations with some pretty major things. And all that happened because Andy sees things truly and he's able to respond duly. And I know that because I know if you went up and you asked him about that, he would, he would you know, his face would turn red and be like, Look, I'm nothing special, okay? Like, <laughs> I'm not. But I know that God can do amazing things. And so I just want to be faithful to that. And he was. And God did begin to change things right then and there. Now, who knows with those that we have similar experiences with, who knows that he might not do the same thing working His grace and His kindness and that gentle strength through us. Because we see truly and we live duly. Because we know that even if we are taken advantage of, guess what? There is a just judge in heaven who will judge all things rightly in the end. Because when you see differently, you interpret differently, and you act differently. You don't fear what the world fears. You fear God, and thus you obey Him and not the dictates of the culture. And if I might put it so boldly, it's not just that your response to hopeless and fearful situations depends on seeing things rightly, nor is it just that your interactions with your neighbors and your enemies depends on seeing things rightly. Your eternal destiny and fate rests upon whether or not you see things rightly. Because you think about this. There were thousands of people who laid eyes on this man named Jesus. But as Jesus himself put it, seeing they did not see. In other words, people looked at the sense data and had important facts that concerned them. An itinerant Jewish rabbi walking throughout Galilee and Judea, working miracles and teaching with authority, but that's all they saw. They saw a prophet like Elijah or perhaps John the Baptist raised from the dead. But there was a small handful of people who when they looked at that same man through the eyes of faith, they didn't see just another prophet. They through faith saw that they were standing in the presence of the Christ, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the commander of angel armies, God incarnate himself, the Savior of of the world. And one group of people rejected Jesus and crucified him. The other bowed down before him and worshipped him. Now which one of them got it right? Those who crucified the Lord of glory or those who bowed their knee before him? It's how you see Jesus and how you respond to him determines whether or not you spend eternity separated from Him under condemnation forever, or whether you spend eternity with Him in a paradise the likes of which you cannot imagine. Or do you see Him as just another great moral teacher? Or do you see Him for who He truly is? The Christ, the Son of the living God, the Holy One, High and lifted up. Because when you see differently, you interpret differently and you act differently. We see truly so that we can live duly. So I pray today.
today, right now, for each and every one of us, whether we've been walking with Christ forever or whether you've not heard his name until you walked into this room. I pray what the Apostle Paul prayed for us in Ephesians. The eyes of our hearts may be enlightened that we may know what is the hope to which he has called us, what are the immeasurable riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. Because when you see Jesus like that, it changes everything. You live fearlessly through faith in his name and you are able to share his gentle strength with the world because you know that he is watching over you and doing better for you than you can ask or imagine. And those who see Jesus like that can't help but want to lift their hearts to him in grateful worship. And I've seen him today. And I want to stand with you and I want to lift my voices with you in worship to him for all he's done. So would you stand with me now? Let's worship him together. stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop
When the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing And when I look at the space between Where I used to be And this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the water, holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me. There is another in the fire. another in the fire oh. All my dead left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore When I fall in the space between all the things of me and this reckoning Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding? Power set me free. There is a grave that holds no body. Now that power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, and I can see the light in the darkness. As the darkness bows to Him, I can hear the roar in the heavens. As the space between where stand, I can feel the ground shake beneath us. As the prison walls came in, nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. I can see the light in the darkness. As the darkness bows to Him, I can hear the roar in the heavens. As the space between where sin, I can feel the ground shaking beneath us. As the prison walls cave in, now nothing stands between.
There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all these things I've seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Oh, I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding? Good you've been to me I'll count the joy of every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be There'll be another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding Good you've been to me I count the joy of every battle I know that's where you'll be Count the joy of every battle I know that's where you'll be Let's pray together Father we are so thankful for these amazing truths that we've heard and sung today. And I do pray that you would please keep our eyes open to these realities. So that in those moments when we're tempted to despair, the fear, the think that you have forgotten us, that we would remember Greater is He who is in us than He who is in the world. And that there really is nothing in all of creation, neither height nor depth, angels or demons, things present or things to come, that can ever separate us from Your love in Christ Jesus. Open our eyes to see these things more and more clearly as we look forward to that day that seeing through faith gives way to seeing you face to face. We look forward to that day. And we ask that you keep us until then. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Horizons Church, I love you and God loves you. May he keep your eyes open this week. And if you're new, I'd love to meet you right over here.